talk to you this morning about how to live holy in an unholy world. We are definitely living in an unholy world, surrounded every day by the works of darkness. The prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the enemy, is out to seek, kill, steal, destroy, but God is faithful as promised. Amen. As our children are being dismissed this morning. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. We've been going through 1 Peter on Sunday night. Tonight we're going to finish up our series, our Wednesday night series. Since we will not have service here Wednesday night tonight, we're going to finish up that, that series on Psalms 119 this evening. I just felt compelled of the Lord to go this direction for today. Read here from 1 Peter chapter 1. It's a lengthy reading this morning, but if you can stand with me, fine. It's wonderful, but if you cannot stand for the duration, I understand. We've got several verses here that we want to read for a text this morning. Beginning in verse 13 of 1 Peter 1, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you and the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls, and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever." I want to talk about this morning, once again, how to live holy in an unholy world. Can we stretch our hands towards heaven one more time? Let's ask God to anoint us today, me to speak, each one of us to receive. Father, we come before you desiring the anointing this morning because we know that the anointing is the difference today. And I pray, Father God, that you just let the precious anointing of the Holy Ghost saturate and fill this place today. Touch us mightily. Touch us wonderfully. Touch us gloriously today. Have your way in us. Have your way through us, Lord. We yield ourselves right now to your will and your way. And we know, Father God, that without you we're nothing. But with you, with you we can accomplish all things. And we just pray, Father God, have your way in the remaining part of the service. Meet with us around these altars this morning. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. We've been going through First Peter. We've made it through the first half. And in the first half of First Peter, of this chapter 1, we talked about walking in hope and walking it out, living it out. And who Peter was talking to there in, those, in the beginning of this letter was those that were scattered and those that were going through severe trials and those uh, that things did not look good for them. And, and it didn't look great at all. But Peter reminds them that God has everything under control. And he, when we read this and when we see this today, it reminds us as well, you may be, feel scattered. You may feel like uh, things are not going the way that you think they should. Uh, but there is a reminder of God's Word today to know that God still got all things uh, under control. Uh, and he told them that they have to put their faith and their trust in God. Uh, that they have to keep their faith. That's what Peter uh, was writing there in this epistle. Uh, but it's also what he was writing for us to read many years later. Uh, that we understand something. We've got to keep our hope and our faith in God. We've got to walk in it. We've got to live in it. They, listen, they had and we have a blessing.
best hope uh, that no one can take away from them. Nobody uh, can take away this hope that we have in Christ. Uh, so we have to understand that. Uh, and then he goes on into the second half of this chapter, uh, and he begins to tell them not only how to walk in hope, uh, but in the second chapter that we've read, second part of this chapter, uh, that we read verses 13 through 23 this morning, He's beginning to tell them and to tell us uh, that we need to be walking in holiness. Uh, hope and holiness go hand in hand. Uh, hope and holiness walk together. First uh, John 3 and 3, John writes this. Uh, he says, Every man that has this hope uh, in him purifieth himself uh, even as he, uh, talking about God, uh, is pure. So we have this hope. What John is saying here uh, is we have a lively hope. Uh, and this lively hope abides in us and there we're going to purify ourselves even as Jesus is pure. We're going to be holy as He is holy. We're going to walk in it. We're going to trust in Him. So a holy people has to do something. A holy people they have a lifestyle. A holy people walks the walk and lives it out. So that's what we want to look at this morning as holy people. This is what our lifestyles are. Number one, uh, as a holy people, we're different uh, from what we used to be as sinners. Thank God for that. Amen. I'm glad to know uh, that no, nothing against those that, that are out there in this world. Uh, I don't hate the sinner, but I do sure enough uh, hate the sin. Uh, I, I hate to know that I would have to be in that life of sin. Uh, so we understand something that if we're born again, we'd live differently. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us that. Uh, we've heard it said, heard it preached, uh, and, and, and quoted many times. Uh, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's what? He's a new new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things uh, are become new. So we're different from what we used to be. God doesn't just uh, remodel us when we get saved. It's not just an upgrade to make us a better us. Uh, God doesn't do that, but God makes us uh, brand new. He makes us new creatures. Uh, that's where the statement comes in, born again. Uh, if you're born again, it's a new beginning. It's a fresh start. Uh, it's a new creation uh, that He has made out of us. Uh, we're not the same person uh, that we used to be. Anybody thankful for that this morning? Uh, I'm not the drunk I used to be, amen. Uh, I'm not the addict I used to be. Whatever uh, you were when you were out in this world, uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I'm not as hopeless, uh, that hopeless case that I once was. Uh, I've been redeemed by the almighty uh, hand of God. He has set me free uh, from the works of flesh. Uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, Paul also writes in chapter Chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, uh, verse 17 and 18, he said, uh, because of this, uh, there's something that we have to do. Because God changed us, uh, he said, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Verse 18, uh, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be uh, my sons and daughters, uh, saith the Lord God Almighty. So here's our goal, church. Uh, not just our goal, but our obligation uh, is to live holy uh, in an unholy world. Uh, that's not just the goal, but that's what we're obligated to. That's why uh, we presented ourselves a living sacrifice uh, that we may be holy and acceptable in His sight. Uh, that's reasonable service. That's the, the task that is at hand this morning uh, to know that that's, uh, that's the task, but it's not always easy, is it? It's not always an easy thing to do. As a matter of fact, uh, it's going to get harder and harder uh, as the days go by. Uh, the environment that we live in, the world uh, that we live in, makes it more and more difficult uh, to live holy. Uh, the influence of the world on the church uh, makes it even more difficult uh, to live holy. Uh, the signs of the times that we're in, uh, there's always been sin. Sin has always been there. Uh, but we've talked a lot about it over the last several weeks. Uh, the world of darkness that we're living in, the influence uh, of the world. We uh, live in a country that started out uh, with in God we trust. Uh, we live in a country that started out with men uh, that wrote our Declaration of Independence. Uh, they were godly men, praying men, and they penned those words. Uh, and when they gave uh, their the instructions in that, uh, it was with the mindset of spiritual things. Uh, it was in the mindset of God first. Uh, it was in the mindset uh, of God 
God bless America and giving something that God can bless. Uh, it was in the mindset of in God we trust. Uh, but we've gotten so far away from that in our country. Uh, not to mention the other uh, places of this world. Uh, but just here in America, it's not easy. Uh, it's difficult with all of that that's going around us. Uh, and it's not just the world system. It's not just the political system. Uh, but it's creeped into the church, Sister Gilda. It's pre- creeped into the church, Brother Bill. Uh, it's slipped in. Uh, there's men that's taking pulpits. Women uh, that's taking pulpits. Uh, and, and just using some of the words of, of a previous pastor, Brother Douglas. Uh, and we have these mammy pammy preachers. These mammy pammy prayers don't work. And the problem that we have is uh, it's not just the world. We can point our finger uh, at the governor, at the mayor, at the president, at Congress and Senate. Uh, there are some deadbeats out there uh, It's trying to be leaders of our country. Uh, and, and they're trying to dictate and they're trying to, we know they're trying that, that effort uh, to make us a socialist, uh, uh, depending on all of that stuff. I understand all that. I don't get into to a lot of politics, but it's right there in front of our face every day. Uh, but we can't point our fingers out there at the world because judgment starts at the house of God. It's because that runs rampant because something went wrong here first. It goes wrong in the pew because something's gone wrong in the pulpit. In church, we've got to take responsibility. He said, if my people, if my people which are called by my name, what he's really saying in essence there, if we would have been praying and believing and living holy and Instead of trying to see how worldly we can live and still be called holy, we wouldn't be in the state that we're in. So so this situation comes down to possibly those mamby-pamby, as Brother Douglas would put it, those preachers that don't have a backbone to stand up for the gospel. We see it all the time. They've got television programs. They get put on talk shows and ask point blank about subjects such as homosexuality and, and things that are, uh, uh, that are relevant in the Christian stand. Not even things that we would call controversial, but just things that are red letter gospel. And instead of them standing for that and saying, yes, I stand upon the word. Uh, well, that's not popular. But I still stand upon it. But instead of doing that, uh, they give in. Uh, they water it down. They sugarcoat it. Uh, they try to make it a little bit easier. Uh, and that's caused many of the problems in our country today. Uh, that when we have an opportunity uh, to stand on a platform and present the gospel, uh, we try to present a counterfeit. We try to present something that will not offend. We try to water it down and sugarcoat it so it will be received better. That's the problem that we're facing today. God has not called us to adjust to this world, but God has called us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we've got to make sure that we're preaching it because many are not preaching on the righteousness and on the judgment of God anymore. They no longer emphasize uh, on the holiness of this life. They no longer focus on that. It's about living your best life now, being the best you that you can be. Sister Gillo and I was talking about one last week uh, that wants to tell us to, to wrote a book entitled I Am. And that I Am only belongs to one, the great I Am. But that book that he wrote was talking about how I am. Building up self and making you better and making you greater and and encouraging yourself. Uh, When I read in my Bible that I must die at an altar. That this old man must be left at the altar. That life uh, that I now live, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Uh, And too many have gotten away from that. uh, And that's the problem. Uh, There's too many not preaching it. Uh, And even in Peter's time, there was many not sharing the truth of God's Word. Uh, But guess who was? Uh, Peter was still writing the church to those who were scattered and those who were all over the place uh, and said, I still got a letter of truth for you. Uh, So in his day, uh, Peter was still declaring the 
truth of God's word and in our day I want to be that voice of one in the wilderness when others refuse to preach it I want to be able to say here I am God I'll still preach the truth of your word sin is still sin wrong is still wrong right is still right it still takes the blood it still takes the blood of Jesus to wash away every sin you still must be born again there's no back door to heaven there is no way that you can get there but through the cross of Calvary. And so that's what Peter was declaring here. He links hope and holiness together. We're living in a time where people are looking for hope. If you want to walk in hope and you want to live in hope, we all do. Nobody likes that hopeless feeling. Anybody like the hopeless feeling? Raise your hand. No, nobody raised your hand. Because nobody likes to feel hopeless. If you want to avoid hopelessness, embrace holiness. And I understand it's hard for us to embrace holiness because of what many of us have heard holiness to be our whole life. Holiness is not hardness. I preached a message one time entitled True Holiness. I preached it several times as an evangelist. It was not a popular message because I preached true biblical holiness. Preached what true biblical holiness is. And what it is, is it's being lined up with the Word of God. Walking in alignment with God's words and God's standards and God's purpose. Not what someone dictates and commands, but what God's Word commands and what God's Word lays out. We need to emphasize that. Peter was emphasizing that. And he said, listen, you've got to know that hope and holiness are linked together. And he tells us that we're going to have to take both of them if we're going to be ready when Jesus comes back back we've talked about flying away this morning if you're going to fly away there's some things that's going to have to be done it's going to be living in hopeless in hope excuse me in, in holiness peter gives us at least five reasons that we should live holy in an unholy world number one he said because jesus is coming because god is holy because of our calling because judgment is coming because of God's love through redemption. Now, it took me a long time for my intro, so I've got to fly through these this morning. But we want to look at these this morning. Number one, because Jesus is coming. In verse 13, he said, the revelation. This is the year of revelation, right? He said, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He, that was just simply stated there. He said, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, why should I live holy? Uh, because I've got a revelation uh, of Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, Jesus is going to be revealed. Uh, or is Jesus going to come? Uh, understand, He's coming back. We used to say, ready or not, here I come. Ready or not, He's coming back. The trumpet will sound we still believe in the rapture. Whew, scared me for a minute there. We still believe in the coming of the Lord. And he's saying here Jesus is going to be revealed uh, and Jesus is going to come. Uh, why should I live holy? Because Jesus is coming. I can't think of a better reason than that for us to live holy. Uh, there's no better reason uh, to live holy. You know somebody's coming to your house, you clean it up. That's just all there is to it. You start shoving stuff in the closet up underneath the bed, wherever you can, uh, to make that room that you know they're going to walk into presentable. Uh, and that's the reality of our life. Jesus is coming back, uh, and we want to be ready. Uh, and there's no better reason that I could think of than that. Uh, writer of Hebrews tells us in 12 and 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see God. Uh, Jesus is only going to take uh, the holy ones with him. He's only going to take the holy ones with him. Only the holy shall enter in. We used to sing that with hands raised, tears rolling down our face. Now we hear that, we get mad. You saying, I'm not holy enough for heaven? Only the holy ones are going to heaven. And the word, not me, determines who's holy. 
God's Word declares unto us. Uh, when He comes back, He's coming back for the holy ones. Uh, so that should be a motivation enough uh, for you and I to want to know uh, what the Bible says about holiness. Uh, it should make us want to get this out and dive into the pages of it every day. Uh, if He requires holiness, uh, I want to be holy. Uh, that should be motivation for us to know uh, that Jesus could come uh, at any moment. Uh, that should be a very huge incentive for you and I uh, to make sure that we're living holy. Uh, we think we've got all the time in the world. The problem with us is uh, we've heard uh, back those of us who's lived this long uh, we heard 88 reasons why he's coming in 1988 uh, and we say he didn't come uh, and we heard how uh, the end of the world was going to come at the turn of the century uh, because there was no way for them to adjust the calendars anymore. Uh, it has to be over. Uh, and then another that they said uh, that their calendar doesn't go any farther so this has to be at the end. Uh, but we have to remember no man knows the day or the hour uh, but be ye ready uh, for in such a time that you think not uh, the Lord is coming back. Uh, how do you know that pastor? Uh, he said because I go to prepare a place for you uh, and if I go uh, I will come again uh, at where I am. Uh, there you may be also. There's a lot of men I don't believe uh, but I believe God. Uh, I take him at his word uh, and I believe uh, that he's coming back. Uh, I believe that he's soon coming. Uh, therefore I want to walk in holiness. Uh, I want to walk in hope. Uh, I want to walk in joy. Uh, I want to walk in peace. Uh, to know that any moment he could return. Because if we're not living right when he comes, guess what? You're still going to be sitting there. That's tough, Pastor. That's truth. If you're not living holy, living accordance to his word, if you're out there trying to play patty cake with the devil, if you have no desire to conform to the image of God's word, if you spend your Sundays listening to the preacher going, uh uh, no, that's too hard. I don't believe it like that. That ain't what I want to do. You'll still be sitting there shaking your head when the rapture takes place. That's hard, Pastor. That's truth. And I preach to you the truth because I love you. And I want you to be ready. Because if any man's not living right when he comes, it's simple. You're not going. I believe that after years of Bible study that many people who claim to be saved are not going in the rapture. Just because they claim to be saved doesn't mean it. There, there's those that have eyes and they see not. We talked about that in our Sunday school class this morning. Ears and they hear not. They have not lived holy. They have not lived separated. They have not lived consecrated lives unto God. Uh, and you know what that does for them? That disqualifies them from the rapture. Oh, that's hard. Nobody's shouting this morning. But I pray that when we get leave here this morning, we're ready. We're living and abiding. We want to make this what calls us to begin to do an evaluation, to begin to search our hearts, to begin to fall across an altar and say, Lord, I don't want to be that one going through the motions. I don't want to be the one that's, that's staking a claim and talking to talk but not walking to walk. I don't want one to, to make others think that I'm saved and my heart's far from you. I don't want to be that one that's got that mask that I put up and hold up Sunday morning so everybody thinks uh, that I'm the perfect Christian while out there living another life. Uh, because number one, be sure your sins will find you out. But number two, uh, we still believe in the rapture. The rapture's going to take place. Uh, and I don't want to be left behind. Number two, uh, because God is holy. Verse 15, he says, uh, but he which hath called you is holy. Uh, so if the one that called you is holy, what did he say? Be ye holy. Uh, in verse 16, he repeats that. Uh, he says in verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy, uh, for I am holy. Uh, and he's saying, if there's any mistake in who called you, I'm the one that called you, and the one that called you is holy. Uh, and God is declaring, I am holy. Uh, it's not boastful this morning. Uh, it we lift our hand and say uh, I am holy uh, listen I'm the holiness of God you're the holiness of God if you're born again uh, sold out blood bought redeemed uh, committed all in uh, you have a right to say I am living a, a life of holy uh, we call this what the holy bible amen why because the content of it is holy I want to be a holy man I want the ladies here to be holy women why? How do we know that? Is it just because the label? Uh, we can hand out uh, uh, name tags this morning. It says holy man, holy woman. 
But that label's not going to determine that is the content. So we can declare to be holy, uh, and that's a good thing. We should declare the holiness of God, uh, but understand that you're uh, not going to be judged by the label, but you're going to be judged by the content. Uh, that we understand something here. He says, uh, be ye holy, for I am holy. The argument here is very logical. It's very simple. You have heard the old saying uh, that there's like a chip off the old block. We talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, they're like their father. Like father, like son. Like mother, like daughter. When my kids do something that's far out in left field, I tell Amy, they're acting just like you. When they're doing something good, I'm like, they're acting just like me. It's probably the other way around. But they begin to chip off the old block. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You see what it's saying? They're saying here that the children inherit the nature of their fathers and inherit the nature of their parents. Uh, and those that were here Wednesday night uh, know that we were talking about uh, coming to church with an expectation. Why? Because that's the nature of God. We come with an expectation of God to heal because we know uh, that's the nature of God. Uh, we come with an expectation of what He's going to do. Uh, I want the nature of God. I, I want to be in the reflection and the image of God. If you're born again this morning, uh, you understand something, uh, that we inherit the nature uh, of our Heavenly Father. Uh, and our Heavenly Father's nature is holy. Uh, and our nature uh, ought to be holy as well. Uh, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1 and 4 uh, that we are partakers of the divine nature. Uh, we're partakers uh, of the divine nature. So our lives ought to reveal uh, that nature uh, in the very way that we live. Uh, if we uh, are partakers of the divine nature of God, uh, if you've partaken of the divine nature of God, the question is, uh, what have you done with it? What have you done with it? Uh, do you have it here? Uh, we have it, uh, and it ought to be revealed uh, in the nature uh, of our lives and how we walk and talk. Peter tells us uh, at what extent we're to live holy. Uh, how do we to live holy? When are we to live holy? Uh, he said, in all manner of conversation. And I'm leaving anything out. When should I live holy? When I come to church on Sunday? Oh, no, you shouldn't live any different on Monday than you do Sunday. You shouldn't live any different on Saturday than you do Sunday. All manner of conversation, every step that you take, every place that you go. The word conversation here is an old English word, and it just simply means lifestyle. An everyday lifestyle. And your everyday, uh, what he's saying in all manner of conversation is every manner of living. Uh, however you do your living, wherever you're doing your living, in every uh, manner of lifestyle. So Peter's telling us uh, that we should be holy in every manner. Uh, some folks have been holy in some areas of their lives, but not others. They're real holy over here, not so much over here. They're really to the point, to the letter here, but they let up here. That's not accordance to God's Word. He says that we've got to be holy in all areas of our lives. In our walk, in our talk, in our actions. This is going to hit you. In our attitudes, in our appearance. All of that is important to God. All of it. So many people can get that appearance thing down, that attitude, rotten. People can look, have that look, but they've got that spirit of gossip. Oh, I think I hit a root there. Actions, talk, walk, attitudes, appearance, all of that's important to God. Then Peter goes on to say that it's not debatable. What do you mean it's not debatable? Because he says we need to do it as obedient children. You let your kids do whatever they want to do? No. They're obedient. We teach them obedience. You say, well, I don't teach my kids obedience. Well, I'll visit them in jail one day. It's reality. If your kids are not teachable now, if they're not trainable now, if they're not coachable now, when they grow up, they're going to be in a world of hurt. They need to understand obedience. And we need to understand, he said, as obedient children. What does that mean? It means that, uh, that we've got to do something. Well, I know my mom and dad told me to do something. One thing we didn't ask was, why? <laughs> you regretted that later. Nowadays, 
questioning. I get on my kids all the time about back talk because they always got some input and they think their input's real good. Problem was, I didn't ask for their input. There's times I ask for my kids' input. There's times that they're involved in the conversation. But there's times that we just simply know what's best for them. And though they can't understand it, and though they get their feelings hurt, and though everybody else is doing it, and we don't allow them to do it, and they're upset, and they go stomping off to their room. Only my kids do that, I know. And, and they get upset with you, uh, and, and they think you're the worst daddy and the worst mama in the world, uh, and they just don't understand. They want to uh, mumble up underneath their breath. I don't know why you wouldn't let me do that. Everybody else doing that, da, 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 and going on and on. Uh, why do we do that? Do we do that so we can go into the bedroom, give each other a high five, and say we won that one? No. We do that because we know what's best for them. We understand uh, what's best. Why? Uh, because we probably made the mistake at some point. Uh, but God is all-knowing and all-seeing. Uh, and we want God to move. Uh, and we want to walk. Uh, but God is saying, I want you to be holy as I am holy as obedient children. Uh, and because we want God to, uh, to have full control of our lives. So what they were saying is, uh, what our parents were saying, what we're saying now, those of us that are parents, uh, it didn't matter why. We just wanted uh, us, uh, our children to be obedient to us uh, and God's the same way uh, he wants you and I to be obedient the true test of whether we're holy or not we covered this Wednesday night we love God's word we trust God's word and what was the final thing those that were here Wednesday night we obey God's word that's the true test true test whether we're holy or not is if we're living in obedience to God's word Peter goes a step further and says uh, that we should totally renounce our old lifestyle. Uh, he said, not fastening ourselves according to our former lust. Uh, we had to come out from among the world and be separate. We're separated from that. I'm not the man that I was. I'm a new creature. We're supposed to live like, act like, talk like, dress like. None of that anymore. We're not to live like we used to live. We're not to like, act like we used to act. You used to be a jerk. When you're born again, you're no longer a jerk. If you're a jerk, get in the altars. You don't talk like you used to talk. If you cuss people out and was rude uh, and, and, and demeaning to people, if men, if you was, when you was in the world, uh, if you disrespected your wife and, uh, and called her names and was demeaning to her and tried to put her in her place and that way to your children, your co-workers, uh, when you're born again, you don't talk like that anymore. It's not always cuss words. Uh, it's not always cuss words that are corrupt communication. Uh, sometimes we just talk wrong. Uh, we talk wrong to people. Uh, we act wrong. Uh, we dress wrong. Uh, when we get born again, uh, we begin to dress differently. Uh, nobody wants to see your nakedness. Cover it up. Uh, we dress modest. Uh, we dress right. We look right. Uh, we don't act the way we used to be. Uh, why? Because we're no longer sinners. Uh, I'm not an old sinner saved by grace. Grace. I, I'm a born again Christian. I, I was a sinner, uh, but thank God uh, He washed me, He cleansed me, uh, and the sin is gone. Uh, and I don't live and abide in sin. Uh, but if sin should get, slip in, uh, if I confess it, uh, He's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me, uh, and I keep walking in grace and mercy. Uh, so we understand something here. Uh, and number three, uh, because we have a calling. You say, I'm not called to do anything. Well, hold on a minute. He said, he which hath called you. You're not born again this morning unless you were called. No man comes to the Lord unless the Spirit draws him. Right? Remember Samuel? He was, he was there and he heard a voice. He thought it was Eli. No, it wasn't Eli. It said he did not yet know the Lord. It was the Lord calling him. That same voice is calling. If you're born again this morning, uh, it's because you've heard uh, the voice of God, whether it was through the voice of a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, uh, a song, uh, or a scripture, or some of us may have heard the audible voice of God. Uh, we have been called by God. Uh, he which hath called you. Uh, we have a high and a holy calling. Uh, Matthew Henry gave this great commentary when he said, uh, If you are a preacher, don't stoop to being a king. If you're a preacher, don't stoop to being a king. If you rephrase that this morning for all the Christians, 
I can take it to that step and say, you can even declare, if you are a Christian, don't stoop to be a king. If you're a born-again believer, you'd be stepping down to take the position of king. Ask Queen Esther. He said, you can't hide in the kingdom. Either you are one of those or you're not. So we have a high and a holy calling as Christians. Our shoulders shouldn't be slumped. We shouldn't have our heads down and walk around like a defeated foe if we're born again. No, those shoulders should be squared back. That head should be held high. And to know that I'm a child of the king. There's royal blood flowing through my veins. If you were from a lineage on the natural side of royalty, you'd walk around acting like it. You see many people that do. But because I'm a Christian, I want to walk around acting like it. Amen. I want to live it out. So we have been called. We've not been called by man, but we've been called by God. We are the church. And in the New Testament uh, uh, definition of the church is simply the called out ones. Uh, So when we say that we are the body of Christ or we are the church, uh, we're saying we're the called out ones. We've been called out from this world. Uh, Who's called you out? God himself. God himself. Jude said this of himself uh, as he began to write his book, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ uh, and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and persecuted in Jesus Christ and called. Uh, So we have been called by God. There's no greater calling on earth uh, than to be called by God. Uh, We've been called out of darkness uh, into this marvelous light. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and 9 he says uh, that we, uh, because of that, we're to show forth the praises of Him uh, who hath called us out of the darkness uh, and into this marvelous light. Uh, We have been called to be holy. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 7 declares uh, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness but unto holiness we've been called unto glory and virtue second peter 1 and 3 declares of him that have called us unto glory and virtue that word glory means dignity we've been called dignity we're saved and god gives us our dignity back there's many that's gone so deep in sin they've lost all dignity They've lost all respect for themselves. Uh, They're a basket case. I don't know where you were at when God found you, uh, but many had got to the place that they lost all dignity. uh, But God gives them their glory and their dignity back. Uh, That word virtue means excellence. We've been called uh, to excellence. Uh, We're to walk uh, in excellence. Uh, We're to live uh, in excellence. Uh, We're to do everything that we can uh, to walk in that. Why? Uh, Because we have received uh, the glory of God. Uh, God receives the glory glory uh, as we walk in excellence Uh, we are ambassadors of Christ we represent Christ Uh, and how many would say this morning he is excellent so we should represent him in excellence we should be holy as he is holy we should be striving for excellence in our Christian walk every day of our lives we've been we've been called we've been called out but we've also been called to inherit a blessing Verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. God said, I called you because I want to bless you. But God don't bless sin. God said, I've called you because I want you to inherit a blessing. We pray all the time, pray that God will bless me. Pray God will, we got a situation and we, we got a, a situation with our home and we need God to bless us in this situation so we can get a home or we need God to bless so we can get a vehicle we need God to bless us for finances or whatever the blessing is that you need God. we're always seeking a blessing from God here's the deal God has called you that you may inherit blessings he wants to bless you I'm not talking about name it claim it blab it and grab it But I'm talking about a life that is in alignment with God's Word. Uh, The writer said this, that we'll prosper and be in good health one way, as our souls prosper. As we focus on being holy, living holy, walking in holiness, we walk in hope. And God sends down the blessings. We're called of God out of darkness unto holiness, dignity and excellence so that we might inherit the kingdom and inherit the blessings of God. What a high and holy calling that is for you and I. Number four, we should live holy in this unholy world because judgment is coming. 
Nobody wants to hear that, but it's the truth. Verse 17 of 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. So here's another good reason why we should live holy, because we're going to be judged on how we live. Can I tell you there's a coming day of judgment, and Peter said that we should fear that day? But not only is there a coming day of judgment, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning, uh, every day is a day of judgment when we live separated from God. When we're living in sin, that judgment of sin is being cast upon every day. So somehow there's very little fear of the judgment of God for today. Uh, why? Because too many look uh, at it being a day of reckoning that's coming. Uh, but the reality is it's every day happening to him. Patrick Henry, the great statesman, said this, uh, I care not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. How could he say, give me liberty or give me death? They asked him one day, why, what was the greatest thought that he had ever had? What was the greatest thought that he ever had? He said that one day I'll stand before a holy God and give an account of my life to him. He understood, I'm going to answer to God and give an account for everything, every action, every thought, every deed. Every outfit, every part of my walk. So understand, friend, one day we will stand before God. We're going to give an account unto Him for how we lived our life, how holy or how unholy we were. Everybody, nobody's exempt for that. One day every knee's going to bow, every tongue is going to confess, and we can get mad at the preacher today because he's trying to, to give us to live a holy life. But just letting you know, you're going to stand before one greater than the preacher one day. You're going to answer to one far greater than any pastor uh, or any man of God on this side. Uh, one day we're going to stand before the creator of all the universe. Uh, and every one of us is going to answer uh, for the deeds that we've done. Uh, and every deed that we've not done, uh, we're, going to, we're going to be answering for uh, the sins of uh, omission as well. To understand uh, that we cannot neglect it, that we've got to walk in it, live in it, uh, and understand that should cause us to fear. To have some fear. Fear God. Walk in faith. It should cause us to want to be very careful how we live. I don't want us to, to live in a way that we think, man, everything's a sin. I've, I've met those people that make everything a sin. It's not what I'm saying this morning. But I'm telling you that we need to walk humbly before the Lord. Before we boldly declare, that's not for me. He's not talking to me. I'll be all right. Make sure we consider it in prayer. Make sure that we take the Word of God with us to that prayer closet and we have a talk with Jesus and we talk to Him. It should cause us to want to do that. I want to be very careful how I live my life. I don't want to be nonchalant. I don't want to be rebellious. I, I don't want to be like... I was. I shared with you when I looked at my dad and told him, you live it how you want to, but that's not for me. I'm going to live it this way. I don't want that. I don't want to look at my Heavenly Father and say, that's not for me. But I want to look at my Heavenly Father and say, I want everything that you have for me. I want everything that you have for me. That's the reason we are the church. First Peter four seventeen and 18. Said, for time has come that judgment must begin. It's not just coming. But he said it must begin, and it begins at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? God is going to begin right here at his house. This is the Father's house. This isn't my church. This isn't your church. It's God's church. It's the Father's house. And he starts here. He starts here. And he begins to bring judgment here. And the righteous, he said, if they scarcely going to be saved, where will the sinner? The word scarcely here means scare, should scare us. Because that word scarcely is with great difficulty or with much work. It's going to take everything you got to hold on, to be saved. It will be the fight of your life. Why, why do you say that, Pastor? Because be sober, be vigilant. 
there's an adversary the devil wants to steal kill and destroy some say i don't believe that i don't believe it's going to take all that effort and all of that diligence Well, if that was the case, all of these pews would be filled because all of those that backslid would still be with us. But the reality, each one of us has been in the church any amount of time. We can sit here right now and think of at least six people that we know that used to serve God that are backslid now. I guarantee it. At least six. Why? Because... The righteous scarcely make it. It's going to be a fight. There has to be a, it can't be a nonchalant, because the nonchalant's not going to make it. It can't be worldly minded. You can't keep your mind in the things of this world and think you're going to make it. They're not going to make it. The unholy, they're not going to make it. Neither are sinners. They're, they're ungodly to know that. It's not going to make it. He said to understand that. We've got to be urged today. If you're not right with God, it's simple. This is the kind of messages we grew up on, and it's the kind of message we still need today and we don't hear a lot of it uh, but if you're not right with God get right with God it's not hateful, it's not mean it's not uh, 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 setting a standard that no one can live up to uh, but it's the simplicity of the gospel, uh, either you're right or you're not, either you trust God or you don't, uh, either you're his or you're not, uh, there is no gray area I know we're living in a time that everything's in the gray area including our gender, they want you to put that in the gray area, you don't have to decide on that, uh, they've actually said in some places uh, that you can't mark the gender on the birth certificate Uh, let them decide when they get old enough that's the society that we're living in today so that's where that mindset comes in Uh, so when we hear messages like I'm preaching to you this morning uh, it's hard to process that uh, through the lens of what we're seeing things in this world uh, but it's still the truth Uh, let me urge you today uh, if you're not right with God uh, get right with God uh, and live for God uh, and do all of that with all of your might uh, with all of your mind with all of your soul uh, because it's simple this morning uh, if you don't do it Uh, you're not going to go to heaven Uh, if you don't live righteous and holy uh, and walk holy before God uh, and surrender completely to God uh, you're not going to make it in the rapture you may be the tribulation pastor of this church I don't know backsliders are going to make great Christians after the rapture but I don't want to take my chances with the tribulation I want to be ready and finally Why should we live holy in an unholy world? Why? How can we live holy? Because of the great cost of redemption. Let's look at verse 18. It tells us that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. We've been redeemed, church, with a great, great price. The precious blood of Jesus. Love that old song. It says, His blood was not just blood of another spotless lamb, but His blood was precious blood, and it washed the sins of man. His blood, it heals my body, sets my spirit free. I'm so glad His precious blood still flows from Calvary. Aren't you thankful for the precious blood of Jesus this morning? It was the costless, most precious thing that could ever be found. The blood and the life of God's only Son. Calvary was not an afterthought, church. Uh, Jesus was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God the Father loved us so much uh, that He was willing to give His own Son. Uh, John 3.16 tells us that. that He loved us uh, so much uh, that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So He gave His own Son that we might be saved. His only begotten loved us so much that He was willing to come in this sin-cursed world. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And He came to be tortured and killed and came to redeem us. Happy dad moment for me the other day. Gracie walked up to me. She said, where is that scripture that says something about the Word became flesh? I said, John 1, 1, baby. She said, yes. That's, I was looking. She said, I thought it was in Romans. So she went back to her room. John 1, 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. To know that Jesus put on this house of flesh, 
bled and died on Calvary for you and I. In this sin-cursed world, tortured, tormented, that awful curse of sin that He took upon Him, died on that cross. Why would He do that? Why? So we should love God. We should love His Son enough to live this life. We should love enough that we should live holy in an unholy world like He asked us to do. We expect that if our kids love us, they're going to do what we tell them to do. And we, we try to get that confidence to know, not out of fear, not out of consequences. Too many people are living their Christian walk out of fear and consequences. They live holy or they live this appearance of holiness and try to shun things because somebody told them they're saved and they're trying to act like they're saved. It won't work that way. If, if we just put a fear in our kids that while they're around us that they do everything right, how many watch Leave it to Beaver? We have some Eddie Haskells on our hand. They look the part in front of those that they're supposed to but out there, there's something that they're not. It's not the kind of kids I'm trying to raise. That's not the try- kind of disciples I'm trying to disciple. It's not that we look good in front of those that we want to think that we've got that appearance. I don't want no and Gracie just to have an appearance of being good in front of mom and dad. But I want them to be able to go out there and live it out because they love us. Because they want to be a, a reflection of us and I want a people that will begin to say I I don't want to just have that appearance of holiness while the pastor's around or while the people of the church are around but I love God and I want to be a reflection of his love I want to be in the likeness and the image of God so it goes so much further than what we try to limit it to so the question is here how about you we should love him enough to do what he asks us to do. How about you? Are you doing what God asks you to do? Are you living a holy life? Nobody can answer this question but you this morning. It's not up to us to look at our neighbors and say, hey, talking to you. Are you living a holy life? No, this question is for you this morning. But you've got to ask yourself this, today, am I living a holy life? Do you have a great expectancy in your heart? Jesus is coming? Or have you forgot all about the rapture? Have you forgot all about the coming of the Lord? I'm looking every day. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But how about you? It's not about me this morning. It's about the receiver of this word. Expectation. What is your expectation this morning? Are you striving with all of your might to enter in at the straight gate to heaven? If so, you're going to be ready. Your ear, what it's saying is, my ear is in tune with the sound of the trumpet. But if not, if you couldn't answer yes to those questions this morning, you need to pray. You need to pray. And you need to pray something like this Lord, search me, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way which is everlasting. And there's many of us this morning can say, Lord, I can save you some time. You don't have to search very long. I'll show you where it's at. It's in my actions. It's in my attitude. It's in the way I talk. Whatever. You know right where it's at. You know where you're coming up short this morning. And you know there's only one that can help us with that. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We cannot make ourselves holy. We cannot make ourselves righteous. But we can submit to His holiness and His righteousness. We can make ourselves unholy and unrighteous, though, by disobeying. But if we say, I'm tired of doing it my way. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just tired of doing it your way. And you're like these men we're singing this morning. Lord, give me revelation. Show me what to do. That could be for the Christian this morning or the one that has not submitted their lives to God. 
saying, I don't know what to do. God's given us a word this morning on what to do. Surrender. Surrender completely to Him. Whether it's this your first time ever in a church or whether you sit here every week. Neither one gives you a pass to heaven. But total commitment, total surrender, total devotion. All to Jesus, I surrender. We sing it, but do we believe it? How many is ready to surrender all this morning? How many is willing to lay it all on the altar this morning saying, I am thine, O Lord? It's either amen or oh me. Because the reality is the answer to that question is either heaven or hell. If you're ready to do it, you're heaven bound. If you're not, you're not. I want to be ready. Amen. Stand with me this morning as these men come today to play some songs, music for us. Maybe you need to pray that prayer, Lord. Give me revelation. Or maybe you could say this morning, thank you, Lord, for giving me revelation, showing me what to do. I need to pray. I need to pray. I want to give you that opportunity this morning to come to this altar and have a talk with the Lord. To say, Lord, He's laid it out for me how to live holy in an unholy world. Give me the reasons why I should live holy in an unholy world. But there's some areas that I feel that I'm coming up short and I need you to help me in those areas. I need you to wash me. I need you to cleanse me. If that's you this morning, this altar is open. Father, we love you today. Thank you that you are holy. Thank you for your holiness, for your righteousness, O Lord. Thank you that you extend to us an invitation to possess and inherit that holiness, that hope, and that righteousness. As we gather around these altars this morning, no matter how holy or unholy we feel, we can come into your presence and experience your holiness, experience your cleansing power, Experience your delivering power, your redeeming power. Wash us, cleanse us, saturate us in your power and your presence today as they respond to this altar this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Won't you come this morning? Let's fill